Hi, I'm Ms. Hearn. If you find this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. That'll help other students to find the video. Let's get started. So the first thing that we're going to cover is called set theory. Chapter two, section one, we're gonna introduce a lot of the terminology and symbols that are used in the study of sets. So what's a set? A set is just a collection of objects, but of course in math, we uh, often are talking about sets of numbers, but it could be any objects and the objects that are in the set are called elements or members of the set. So set and elements are two vocabulary words that you need to be familiar with. When we define a set, we need to do so very precisely. And we can do this in a few different ways. We can use a word description. We can list the, all the elements of the set out. For example, the set of all students in this class, I could list out all the names. That would be the listing method. Or we can use something called set builder notation. And one of the things you're going to need to be able to do is to go back and forth between these different ways of defining a set. As an example of a set that we could describe using words, you could say the set of even counting numbers less than 10. By the way, counting numbers is referring to exactly what it sounds like. It's the set of numbers that starts with one, two, three, and so on. It's how we learn to count when we're a kid. Who remembers what even means? Two, four, six. That's right, two, four, six, anything so that's a multiple of two or divisible by two, good. If we were asked to list them, what would be the set of even counting numbers less than 10? What would the elements of that set be? Good, two, four, six, and eight are even numbers that are less than 10. When we say the listing method, there is a specific notation that we expect you to use. You're going to use these curly brackets and then you're gonna list each of the elements that are in the set with a comma in between. Set builder notation is gonna seem a little silly at first. I promise it is useful in certain circumstances. So this is what set builder notation looks like. It has the curvy brackets like the listing method. And then you give a name, a variable name to the elements in the set. Like here I'm using the variable x. This is a name for any random element of the set. And then what you do is you put this bar here. This bar is read such that it's a shorthand notation. We're very, very lazy in math. We don't like writing all these words out. So we have all these little notations. And so this is saying the set of all elements x such that, and then we have all of this is just describing x, describing the elements of the set. So what do we know about the elements of the set? We know that they're even counting numbers less than 10. Sometimes this description is given in words. Sometimes it'll be like an inequality, x is less than 10 or something like that. There are some situations where you cannot use the listing method. And so you have to use a set builder notation. Now, when we're talking about sets, while we use uh, lowercase letters, like the little x we saw a minute ago to represent the elements of the sets, we use capital letters generally to represent the set itself. So the set including one, two, three, and four could be called the set A. It's also possible that a set has nothing in it. This set is called the empty set. It's a unique set. A couple of different ways that you can represent the empty set. One, you can just make the curvy brackets, but with nothing in them. So that's a set. The curvy brackets indicates it's a set. And then the fact that there's nothing listed indicates there's nothing in the set. But there's also another notation, which is actually more common. Usually people use this circle with a line through it. Don't let that fool you. It is not a zero. The reason why we use this notation is that you've probably seen in the past and we'll we'll see more in this chapter often the relationships between sets are represented in something called a Venn diagram and in a Venn diagram a circle represents a set so what this is actually is a circle with a line through it so it's got the set but it's crossed out because there's nothing in the set Another symbol that we're going to be using is this elongated E symbol here. And the reason why we use an E is because we are talking about elements of the set, E for elements. So for example, this notation here, two is an element 
of the set one, two, three, four. That's how you would read that. Okay, but it's so much faster to write two, the elongated E, and then the set one, two, three, four, then write out the whole sentence. And what do you think this symbol here means that has the elongated E with a line through it? Very good. It means not an element of. So A is not in the set. All right, one of the types of problems you'll have is we'll give you either set builder notation or word description, and you have to give us the list of elements. So here we have set of all X such that X is a natural number between three and eight. By the way, natural number is just another name for a counting number. So we're still talking about one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Using proper notation, four, five, six, seven, with the curvy brackets and the commas, exactly. So whenever it says between, we're not going to include those numbers. If we wanted to include three and eight in the set, we would put the word between three and eight inclusive. And that would be three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In order to work with sets, we're going to need to know some basic sets of numbers. We've already talked about the natural or counting numbers are the numbers one, two, three, four, and so on. And that's what this ellipsis is representing here. This means that the pattern, it just keeps going. But there are other sets of numbers. These number sets developed over time. So you're going to notice there's a relationship between them that we kept kind of as humans, as we started to conceive of um, quantities, we realized we needed more ways to represent different quantities. For example, it took a really long time before we actually conceived of the number zero. There's a set of numbers called the whole numbers, which is basically just the counting numbers with zero added to it, but it took a really long time to get to that point. And then eventually we maybe had the idea of negatives because we would um, we traded in chickens, <laughs> and we um, but then we owed somebody three chickens, so we have the idea of a negative quantity. So we have the set of numbers called the integers, which includes all of the whole numbers plus the negative versions of the counting numbers. Um, fractions, a half a chicken. So we had the idea of the rational numbers. By the way, rational numbers include the integers because any integer can be written over one as a fraction. So the rational numbers are just fractions. This is actually a really good example of where set builder notation is useful. You can't list all the fractions very easily. So instead, we say, okay, it's going to be the set of all numbers of the form P over Q, where P and Q are integers and Q can't be zero because you can't divide by zero. Why don't we just call them the fractions? Because um, we use the uh, root word ratio. We think of these as ratios, so they're rational numbers. Rational numbers have the property that if you write them as a decimal, they're going to either terminate, like 1 fourth is equal to 0 0.25, it stops after two decimal places, or they're going to repeat, like 1 third is 0 0.333 forever. There are also decimals that don't have the characteristic that they terminate or repeat. These are special numbers called irrational numbers. They're not rational, so they're irrational. Does anyone know a famous irrational number that you've heard about? That the decimal goes on forever without repeating? Very good. The number pi. You even spelled it right. Excellent. So the number pi, 3.14157 dot dot dot, it goes on forever without repeating is an example of an irrational number. But actually an, another type of irrational number is like when you take the square root of 2, you get an irrational number as well. Cannot be written as a fraction. People actually were put to death over this uh, idea that there existed numbers that couldn't be written as fractions. They thought that meant that the universe was imperfect, and that was sacrilege. So interesting little history there. If you take the numbers that can be written as a fraction and put them together in one big set with those that cannot, you get what we call the real numbers. And actually, this is not the extent of our number system. It, there are other types of numbers as well, but for most of the stuff that we do, we use real numbers. We're not going to include anything beyond the real numbers in this class. All right, we have some shorthand notation for each of these. Uh, the natural numbers is a bold N. The whole numbers is a bold W. The integers, I do not know why, but it's a bold Z. 
Um, the rational numbers, because they are quotients, which means to divide, it has the bold Q for quotient. There is no special letter for irrational, but as we'll see in this class, uh, if you put a little uh, apostrophe next to a symbol for a set that means that it's not in the set so this symbol would be not in the rational numbers so that would be the irrational numbers and then the real numbers got the letter r all right so i want to show you an example of a diagram where we represent the relationships between these sets that we just discussed the real numbers the rational numbers irrational numbers integers whole numbers and natural so the largest set is a set of real numbers so this is going to be considered our universal set, because we're not going to consider anything besides real numbers. And then within that set, we can actually sort of split it in half. On the one hand, we have those rational fractions that are obviously real numbers, like 1 half equals 0 0.5. Okay, and then on the other hand, we have the irrational numbers like pi, which is approximately 3.14 one, five, et cetera, it goes on forever. There is no more subdividing the irrational numbers, but the rational numbers can be subdivided a lot. For example, one subset that's contained in the rational numbers is the integers, right? Because like the number three can be thought of as three over one, and that is a rational number and it's an integer. The integers have within them the whole numbers, which you recall the whole numbers are like 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And within the whole numbers, we have the natural numbers, which is basically all the whole numbers except 0 in there. Okay, so this is the relationship. It's one set inside of the other.